Ladies and gentlemen, good evening, and thank you for joining us for our fifth Newport Lecture Series presentation of the 2020-2021 academic year, teaching leadership to Navy senior leaders and doing so virtually. I'm George Lang, CEO of the Naval War College Foundation, and it is my pleasure to welcome you to this presentation tonight. I also wanna thank our trustees, our members, friends, and benefactors, as well as my staff, for their continued support and commitment for the missions of the Naval War College and Naval War College Foundation. Particularly this year, as many of us have, and still do, grapple with the challenges of the current global pandemic. <clears throat> Before I continue, just a reminder that should a question come to you during the presentation, please submit it via the Q&A box, and I'll be happy to present them to our guest speakers during our Q&A session after their presentation. As many of you know, this is an event that is typically hosted monthly during the academic year at the Naval Station Newport Officers Club, usually preceded by a 30 minute reception where guests can mingle with Naval War College faculty, staff and friends, and typically the guest speaker of the evening. But obviously since COVID took center stage earlier this year, we've been bringing this presentation and many others hosted by the foundation to you virtually, which have become, which have become quite popular. A significant benefit of this approach is the opportunity to interact with members and friends across the nation, not just in the local area. So we appreciate you tuning in from afar. Now to introduce and welcome your guest speakers this evening. That's right, we have two Naval War College distinguished faculty members with us tonight. Dr. Alenda Johnson, professor in the College of Leadership and Ethics, and Dr. Liz Cavallaro, assistant professor in the College of Leadership and Ethics. Dr. Johnson has been with the Naval War College since 2010. She has significant experience advancing leader development for the U.S. Navy. She advises and supports senior military leaders, develops strategy, and leads team efforts. She serves as course designer and lead facilitator for the Navy's two-star flag officer and senior executive service leadership courses. A passionate teacher and educator, she is recognized for her teaching expertise with professional military education institutions and beyond. So she often supports other military commands, including U.S. Army Special Forces, in their lead and development, in the leader development, as well as nonprofit and corporate organizations, where she instills in others the courage and confidence to lead. Dr. Johnson earned her Bachelor of Science degree from Florida A&M University School of Business and Industry in Business Administration and Marketing an MBA from Florida A&M University School of Business and Finance, and her PhD from the University of Pittsburgh Katz Graduate School of Business in Organizational Behavior. Dr. Liz Cavallaro has been with the Naval War College since 2016. She holds a doctorate in education and, and is an adult development scholar and professional executive coach. She too contributes to Navy-wide efforts to operationalize Navy leader development builds Navy leader self-awareness through executive coaching and assessment instruments, and teaches in the Stockdale Leader Development Concentration and facilitates Navy flag officer and senior executive service leader development courses. She conducts scholarly research in self-awareness, cognitive development, mental complexity, and organizational development. Dr. Cavallaro earned a, a Bachelor of Arts from the University of New York at New Paltz in Public Relations and Organizational Communication, a Master of Arts from George Washington University in Organizational Management, and a Doctor of Education from George Washington University in Human and Organizational Learning. Ladies and gentlemen, without any further ado, please give a warm virtual welcome to two special Naval War College faculty members, Dr. Alenda Johnson and Dr. Liz Cavallaro. Thank you, George, thank for those you. lovely introductions. And thank you to the Foundation for providing this forum for discussion. Tonight, we'd like to invite you into a conversation about our experiences developing and teaching a leadership course for two-star Navy admirals. As we developed this presentation, we started by considering some questions that we thought this might, audience might have uh, about teaching leadership to senior Navy leaders. What would you be most curious about? What would you wonder when you saw the title and event description? We identified several likely questions, such as, how do we know that we can provide these admirals value? How do we identify what they need? How do we know that we're using two-star time most effectively? How do we know if we're getting it right? And what gives us 
to behavioral scientists and educators the right to teach these senior naval leaders anything? These are not questions with simple answers, and we've spent a lot of time grappling with them. So we realize that perhaps the best way for us to provide insight into these questions is by sharing some stories with you from the past few years of our work in senior leader development. Our first story of the evening is called, Why Us? Address the why us question. Let me first tell you just a little bit about our team in the College of Leadership and Ethics. And then to share a short story about an unexpected encounter that led to our very first two star leadership course four years ago. Since 2006, our team at the Naval War College has been studying two and three star leadership, specifically what it takes to lead effectively at the operational level of war. We've studied best practices across services and in industry. We've researched behavioral and cognitive requirements for leading in complex environments. And we've surveyed admirals about the education and training they received or didn't receive in preparation for flag level leadership. We learned a lot of good stuff. But we also identified some gaps in what the Navy offered, or more specifically didn't offer, to further prepare naval officers to lead at the flag level. Notably, we discovered a couple of potentially limiting assumptions. First, the belief that leadership is leadership is leadership. Either you have it or you don't, and it's the same no matter what level. Second, that command experience is the only way to really learn how to lead. Come up with the belief that you can't really teach leadership. And third, that modeling the behavior of the leaders is a sufficient form of leadership preparedness. In other words, just do what I do and you'll be a good leader. Essentially, the Navy had placed this concept of leadership in a box, primarily equating leadership with command at sea. And while there's certainly some truth and a whole lot of value in that statement, and the Navy definitely produces great leaders, as scientists and educators who are committed to the learning, growth, and development of people, we knew that there was much more that could be or perhaps should be done, especially to further the capacity of flag officers to lead in their higher level complex and uncertain contexts. The question, of course, was would we ever be able to get Navy senior leadership, that is the chief of naval operations, the CNO or the vice chief, to listen to what we have to say, and more importantly, to just do it. And then something quite unexpected happened. About five years ago, I was invited to participate in a leadership summit at Duke University at the Coach K Center of Leadership and Ethics, the Cole Center. Unbeknownst to me, also participating in the summit was the then Vice Chief of Naval Operations. During that week, the Vice Chief and I, along with another Army General, had a number of great conversations about senior leader development where I was able to share a lot of our team's work. Honestly, it was just really cool to just engage in these open conversations with these four stars who were clearly committed to making their leaders and their organizations better. Well, several months after the summit, the vice chief came to Newport and he invited me and a colleague to join him for dinner. It was awesome. We had this three hour free flowing unencumbered conversation uh, at Midtown Oyster Bar, or Oyster Bar, by the way, for the Newporters out there. Uh, we talked about expectations for Navy leaders and how to build trust with subordinates. And eventually the vice, what the vice chief wanted to see in his flag officers and the gaps that we saw in flag officer development that limited some of those capabilities. The vice chief also highlighted the fact that his two stars had very few opportunities to interact with one another. 
And so we all agree that there was a need to break out of the Navy's leadership box. And it was in that moment that we began to scribble out the contours of a two star leadership force, literally on the back of a napkin, which I still have. It was very exciting because this would be a first for the Navy. And it was during that discussion that we also convinced the vice chief that the course had to be designed with a developmental approach, the antithesis of the Navy's traditional training model. And so that's how you end up with a team of behavioral and social scientists, most of whom have never worn a uniform or led as senior executives, developing and teaching a leadership course for two star admirals and SESs. You see, senior leader development is less about adding specific skills to a leadership toolbox and much more about building and expanding the capacities that these senior leaders already possess. Which begs the question, how do we determine what was needed in order to meet the same? Which leads to our second story. What did we need to do? So we were entering a bit of an unknown. It was clear that whatever we created would need to be different from anything that we'd done before. So inputs for the course came from senior Navy leaders, the chief of Naval operations and the vice chief regarding what they needed from their two stars. Inputs also came from our team's research on gaps in flag officer development, as well as research from the literature on developing executive level leaders and our learnings from teaching a diverse array of naval and joint students of multiple different ranks in the past. From all of that work, a couple of clear themes emerged to us, particularly in terms of what these leaders needed in order to operate effectively in their complex and often unprecedented environment. I'll share two stories that further illustrate how we figured out what we needed to do one from the very start of this four-year journey, and one from just a few months ago. So the older story um, is called, I Can't Believe They Listened to Me. Shortly after receiving the tasking, a few members of our team gathered together in a classroom in Loose Hall, and we were poring over several guiding documents, explicating the many significant demands on senior leaders. At the time, as the most junior member of the team, and probably in the whole building, I admittedly did not understand the nuance of much of the strategic guidance. However, as an adult development scholar, I did notice the clear thread connecting many of these demands on senior leaders. Demands related to agility, rapid learning, integrative collaboration, navigating risk, strategic communication, interconnected relationships, maintaining resilience, and so on. From an adult development perspective, all of those things are capacities, not just competencies, not just skills or talent tools, rather the and sense-making capacities required for effective senior leadership. And what we know from the research is that capacities must be expanded through cognitive and affective transformation, a transformational experience in the individual. So I shared this with the team the concept. Olenda applied the theory to build a framework based on her expertise in curriculum development and the science of teaching and learning. And our teammates added Navy cultural context regarding senior leader assumptions and expectations and how to disrupt them. So this framework emerged and it paved the way for the creation of the course. And it was designed specifically around the science and literature behind enhancing the cognitive capacity of adults. So this framework now provides the outlines for the course every year, but it also allows for continual iteration and evolution that we can build upon based upon what they need next. Our team now uses some version of that framework for not only the two-star course, but multiple other courses that we teach as well. I couldn't believe that they listened to me that day, but they did, and I'm really thankful for the creativity and the collaboration of the group. Fast forward a few years, 
And we're now preparing to deliver the course for the fourth time. This is just a few months ago. We get to the second story called the one where we threw everything out. Four months before the course, Belinda and I were learning our way through Zoom during our brainstorming sessions. Uh, we were muddling through online learning and many other challenges of learning in general. And we recognize the importance of changing our approach to ensure that we can still provide value under these dramatic different conditions. To figure out what these senior leaders needed now, in addition to our previous approaches, we engaged in a deliberate perspective taking exercise. Perspective taking a cognitive process that we teach our students. It allows for deeper understanding and appreciation of complex challenges and environments by stepping into and thinking of others. So from this exercise, two needs have stood out to us for the course. The need to create a human-centered experience, one that takes into account what the leaders have been experiencing this year, acknowledging the unique challenges, stressors, isolation, and frustration of the current environment, and attempting to offer something that would not only be a break from that burden, but also would actually be refreshing and re-energizing for them. And the second need we identified was considering the need to leverage the virtual environment to our advantage in creating a developmental experience. And by developmental, what we mean is capacity expanding. So it had to be challenging, enriching, broadening, impactful, and even productive, but still all the while serving that first need, the human need. So the tough thing about perspective taking is that in order for it to have value, you have to apply your newly broadened scope and perspective on the hand. So we had to stick to our commitment delivering on those two needs, essentially practicing what we preach. One month before the course, we had created five days of brilliant career. There was synchronous work that we do with the whole group in the mornings over Zoom, asynchronous work that they would do in small groups in the afternoons, solo homework for the evenings, readings, videos, reflection assignments. It was serving that second need perfectly. But one morning, Alexa and I hop on Zoom for our regular meeting, and we looked at each other and almost simultaneously said, we have to change all of this. We did not expect more for commitment. This was not a course built for humans. So we threw everything out. With four weeks to go and a two day first rehearsal, we detailed the entire five day agenda and built it from scratch. And we did that by focusing on three key elements that we know from experience how to serve both. brings us to our third story, what we created. And so we'll describe just a little bit about some of those uh, elements that Liz references, specifically thinking capacities, peer support, and reflective practices. Now, for context, our prior three courses, which included anywhere from 24 to 30 admirals and senior executives, were one week residential experiences at conference centers. The in person engagement was vital to the developmental and relationship building processes, but clearly this year we didn't have that option. But that didn't mean that we had to compromise on the learning. Because again, um, as Liz said, we had to practice what we preach and leverage this dynamic environment to create a valuable experience for these senior leaders, which, by the way, this year also included a Marine general and a admiral from an and admiral from the Royal Navy. And one of our guiding principles that we were absolutely adamant about was that the virtual course could not seem like just another Zoom meeting. So we were very deliberate about establishing a pro professional virtual presence and facilitating dynamic interaction. We created high quality graphics and videos and utilized available virtual tools to shape an engaging human experience. 
Now, one of the three uh, learning areas in which we utilize these virtual tools to great effect um, had to do with challenging and disrupting the default thinking habits of these leaders, which takes us back to leadership in a box. You see, our research shows that Navy leaders tend to think or are conditioned to think in very structured and programmatic ways. Yet the environments in which these senior leaders must lead are unstructured, dynamic, and unpredictable, requiring more fluid ways of thinking and more fluid ways of approaching decision making. But you can't just say to someone, be more agile in your thinking and expect that to happen, especially if it's not a natural proclivity. This type of mental agility is a cognitive capacity that must be further and deliberately developed. And so we created experiential learning interventions that disrupted and advanced the senior leaders thinking habits. For example, in preparation for the course, the leaders were required to read a report about uh, a key Navy system, elements of which could be viewed favorably or unfavorably. Then during the course, Liz tasked the leaders to collectively capture, using virtual tools, all of their yeah buts. In other words, their knee-jerk reactions to reading the report, particularly uh, any thoughts that might disconfirm the report's findings. The idea was to get the leaders to appreciate their context by engaging in an honest assessment of their assumptions. They then collectively discussed these assumptions, and then they took it a step further and had to consider alternate perspectives of those same assumptions to help them think about their year buts differently, which requires a degree of agile thinking. It was so great because the conversation was robust and the learning engagement turned out to be very enlightening, which helped these leaders practice and expand the way they might think about their own complex adaptive challenges for which they have responsibility and accountability. Yet, in order for this development to become sticky. In other words, in order for it to be applied outside of the classroom setting, it wasn't enough for us to just tell these leaders about certain cognitive concepts. We had to engage them in their own learning and more importantly, leverage the opportunity for them to learn together. For this next piece, I'll return for a moment to the why us story. While creating the developmental experience is key, and that's the thing that we do well, perhaps even more important is ensuring that the leaders have the support and wisdom of people who deeply understand their context and role. Part of this is ensuring we have excellent guest speakers, Navy and DOD senior leaders to provide their unique perspectives and illuminate the strategic context, executives from other industries to bring in fresh ideas, and alumni from past courses to share their ideas for practical application of the course content. But another part of that is ensuring that we take advantage of wisdom in the group. Level gets so opportunities to connect with each other, and the course allows dedicated time for that connection. While simply the experience of getting in touch and having great conversations with peers has tremendous value on its own, we are actually also able to do more. We're able to use that time to enhance the development value of the course content through structured peer to peer engagements. So, one piece of this is that throughout the week, the leaders work together in consistent small groups, collaborating as a team to apply the course concepts to current Navy imperatives. Apart from those groups, also assigned a partner for one-on-one peer coaching. This is a really simple exercise. I give them a list of a few rules to follow for how to have a coaching conversation and a discussion prompt, a single open-ended question related to some element of the course content that they'll have to have their conversation started. 
and then you get together with your partner and you just run with it. And the best part of this is it doesn't actually matter that much if you follow the instructions perfectly. You don't tell them that. But I think behind this is it just matters that we create a dedicated space for them to not only connect and support each other, but to do so in a way where they're attempting to try to really bring each other value through a coaching conversation. And it works. We get amazing feedback on this every year, including that they often stay in touch well after the course. We'll share more of their feedback. So the third focus area was self-reflection. And we know from both research and what we've been told repeatedly from three and four star admirals, as well as other senior DOD leaders, is that regularly setting aside space to think is essential for leading effectively as flag officers and senior executives. So we built into the course opportunities to engage in deliberate reflective practice. For example, again, prior to the course, the senior leaders completed a lengthy survey with a number of open-ended questions about their experiences with complexity, their approaches to framing complex challenges, as well as the extent to which they capitalize on their available support structures. We use the survey for two purposes. First, of course, for data collection, but secondly, as a vehicle for individual and collective reflection. So during the course, we compiled some of their collective responses. We paired those with uh, some prompt questions, and then we provided that packet to the senior leaders as an end of day reflection assignment. So just as an example, here's a response from one of the admirals the following day after the first assignment. And I quote, reading last night's survey reflections on individual challenges was powerful and put me in a better place for learning today, better perspective in all caps to read and more fully appreciate how my classmates are dealing with acquisition, maintenance, operations, policy issues that are 100% connected with my own mission and my own challenges, that led to really productive discussions following BCNL's presentation in our small group session. That's a wow. And it's certainly a powerful affirmation of our learning and development approach as it relates to reflection. Which gets us to our final story. What did the admirals tell us that helped us know that for the most part, we got this a little bit right? So. Clearly, senior Navy leaders exist in a context that operates at the speed of light. Things are constantly moving and constantly changing. This requires flag officers and SESs to engage leadership capacities that go way beyond the leadership box that has served many of them for more than 30 years. Our charge then was to encourage nourish, elevate, facilitate, and reinvigorate these amazing leaders. So throughout the course, we asked for daily feedback to track the learning and development. Now, certainly there were a few recommendations for improvement, but the bulk of the feedback affirms that we fulfilled the two needs previously identified. One, the need to create a human-centered experience that took into account what these leaders have encountered in this unprecedented year. And two, that we effectively leverage the virtual environment to enable a valuable developmental experience. So here are just four examples of what they told us in that feedback. Quote, just a great... The week has helped me come to grips with the reality that I need to take charge of my time and my energy in order to not stagnate 
I believe in some ways I have in this very odd COVID-19 impacted year of 2020. I am committed to, one, establishing a habit of self-reflection. Two, installing some learning methods in my HQ staff battle rhythm. And three, will absolutely pursue a tailored education program through the Naval War College over the coming months. It's been an exceptional week. Thanks for the facilitation. In response to the question, as a result of this course, have you strengthened your capacity to think and influence as a senior leader? Quote, absolutely. From the frameworks Dr. O and Dr. Liz provided to peer coaching techniques to tapping into 30 extraordinary leaders and partners, lead the week more equipped than I started. Quote, first, this was an energizing experience intellectually and that we were able to spend time with members of our flag wardrobe. It might be due to the limitations induced by COVID, but I haven't felt this influential as a team for a long time. And finally, the week reaffirmed our role as change agents who have to work across the enterprise to seek opportunities, identify talent, get rid of flawed, broken, ineffective tools and processes, and innovate to regain competitive advantage, compete and win in all we do. I have confidence not in that we're world class, but rather that I can make and will make a difference. And that SECNAP, CNO, and my bosses accept me to work to that end without being told and without permission. Sorry, I always get choked up when I read that feedback. And we have many more pages just like that. So what that says is we have absolutely amazing senior Navy leaders, leaders who lead and care for our sailors and protect our families and our nation. Uh, Liz and I are just extremely honored to continue to be able to contribute just a little bit to their personal development, their individual growth, and their leadership effectiveness for the good of all of us. We're grateful for the privilege to serve our Navy's leaders, and it has been pure joy. And so with that, we just really want to thank you for allowing us to share a few of our stories about teaching leadership to senior Navy leaders and doing so virtually. Thank you very much. And now I will turn it back over to George for the Q&A. Thank you, everybody. Thank you, Dr. Johnson and Dr. Cavallo. Uh, a, an intriguing topic, and I, I actually have a lot of questions myself, but uh, obviously over to the crowd. Uh, we've got just about 25 minutes or so available for, for questions. Uh, and if you have one based on the, the, the present, uh, Dr. Johnson, Dr. Kepelauer's presentation, please put it in the Q&A box and I'll certainly address or get to them as many as I can um, with the, in the available time. But maybe just to, to, kick us, to kick it off a little bit, um, is the course for the senior leaders, is it, is it, is it a mandatory course by, by Navy uh, that all flag officers and SES attend or is it a voluntary course? Uh, no, it is a mandatory course. Uh, it is coordinated through Flag Matters, and uh, it is required for all two-star uh, admirals. Of course, uh, there are different stages, but generally we have, as I said, 24 to 30, and it is mandatory. Wow, so that's 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 pretty that's that's a phenomenal effort undertaken by the by the Navy. So I appreciate you providing some of the feedback because I think that was my my initial sense. I mean, I served for 32 years in the Navy and, and I know amongst my colleagues, at least at the time, you know, there was an opinion that, hey, I wouldn't be in the position that I'm in now if I'm not a good leader. So I must be a good leader. So why am I in this course? You know, what what could I possibly learn more? So you you you, you did a terrific job of outlining uh, the depth at which you can take this this education experience. So thank you for that. But I wonder initially, how receptive did you find the students? Did you maybe even find that that was the mentality initially, particularly of some senior flag officers, 
and they're, and they're being schooled, if you will, by uh, you know civilian um, smart civilians, but researchers and, and and practitioners in the field. Liz, do you want to try that, and then I'll hop on. Sure, uh, it's a fantastic. Laughing, right? <laughs> yeah, we're we're both laughing because it's it's the right question. It's a fantastic question. Um, so. Certainly over the course of the four years, the responsiveness and openness has evolved. Um, I think there are a lot of factors that go into that. The, some of the Navy cultural norms around this kind of development and how different what we were trying to do was, certainly it was more of a surprise to folks at the beginning, whereas now it's become somewhat institutionalized. And I think that folks hear about the courts from their predecessors, from their bosses and others. And so each year we get a little bit more openness by day one. Um, but regardless of that, it's always a challenge, and I think anyone in any field would find that with senior executive development um, based on the very premise that we started this presentation with, which is what can we teach them anything about leadership, right, when they're this advanced in their career. And so because of that, we significantly build into that learning and development framework that we spoke about multiple opportunities to set the tone and culture of the classroom and of the cohort, that group of 30, um, to engender that openness, trust, um, shared dialogue, psychological safety, um, a growth mindset so that we are actually working every day to help them find ways to counteract those very natural sort of resistance and skepticism. And so it's actually built into the curriculum and it's part of what we're teaching conceptually and theoretically. So we've really found that that evolves. And again, it's many factors. We can maybe hopefully attribute some of it to that curriculum, but in general, it's something that year after year, I think the course builds a reputation and, and we're getting leaders who are more excited to be there. Yeah. I think uh, you, you hit it on the on the nose there, Liz. I would say the other thing is we do a lot of prep work beforehand. So in addition to the the, the framing and, and the things that Liz talked about, um, uh, Peg Klein, Rear Admiral retired Peg Klein, who is the dean of our college, she actually calls every single one of the identified participants beforehand and they, she spends 15 to 20 minutes just sort of outlining what they can expect and getting a sense of where they are and that has made a huge difference uh, and so it's not just hey you've been tapped to go to this course and you show up there are a lot of things that happen before that they also um, have some uh, executive coaching and do some self-awareness. And so we certainly approach the course not as something that's static. It's a one thing that you jump in and you jump out of, but that it is a part of that continuous learning and continuous growth. The other thing that has happened is we often bring uh, admirals who were in an earlier class to the current class uh, to talk about a year later. What are they still thinking about or what are they engaging in? Do they draw from the course that for in some cases they're now three stars and how that fed into that and that certainly helps too. So I think culturally, you're absolutely right, George. When we first started, it was the attitude that you described. Um, but over the last four years, we've seen that change and we've seen this the the recognition that yeah, I, I can continue to be better and there is more to learn and they're open to that learning, which is, which is just phenomenal. Over. No, that's, that's terrific. I, I appreciate that. So a couple of questions coming in from Jim McHugh. Has there been a thought of expanding this to all service flag and general officers? Yeah, well, each of the service uh, approaches their general officer development differently. Uh, I know I've, I've worked with the Army and the Army War College, and they have um, their own uh, program. Uh, it's designed differently. Uh, we come at it in different ways, but I think that's also very much reflective of the different cultures. I know the Air Force similarly has different uh, courses and programs for their um, for their general officers. I think the difference is that um, we've adapted ours for our particular culture and our our um, uh, leaders' particular needs. But um, certainly, would welcome the opportunity to continue to share that knowledge and that goodness, which we have done in some joint uh, educational settings, sharing what we've done. 
Right, right. No, thank you. Um, <clears throat> from Michael Macbeth, how do you emphasize listening as an important element of communications? Go, Liz, that's yours. <laughs> um, so two quick things on that. Um, the first, which uh, we can we can give credit to our former colleague who Olenda mentioned early in our presentation, um, is always bringing into the course the concept that is important to listen to understand rather than listen to refute. So that is a quote that tends to come up in every session that we have. Um, and it's something that it's a concept that they really tend to to appreciate, I think, because of the, the level of um, the fact that they've started to see that in their career. They, they know that over a long career and, and a culture that there has been some ingrained thinking habits and patterns in most senior leaders around listening to refute or listening to respond with skepticism or listening to formu formulate your own argument. Um, and while there may be a common place for that, I think at the level that they're at and the complexity and nuance of things that they're being briefed on, things that they're collaborating with other senior leaders on, there's a recognition and that, that need to listen at a deeper level and do so um, genuinely to understand and perhaps even to take the perspective of the other speaking um, is really important. And so that's why we teach perspective taking. The other element of the course that gets at listening is the peer coaching process. So I didn't describe that in detail, but one of the core guidelines that we spend a lot of time building before we send them off into those coaching conversations is the active listening component. And it goes deeper than just, hey, listen to your partner, listen very closely, you know, care, show care and concern for what they're saying. Um, it is actually about the entire mindset that you have when you coach, which is very different from counseling, mentoring, teaching, or telling someone what to do or giving them advice or guidance. It is based on the premise that you believe they have the answer within their, themselves, and your job as the coach is to facilitate an open conversation, to facilitate a flow in their thinking, to get them thinking and clarifying their own ideas in a, in a way that maybe they have been unable to do before the conversation. And so the active listening that is required to do that and the depth of listening, um, Engaging in that practice in the peer coaching conversation, the feedback we get is that they're then able to translate that into a wide variety of other settings where it's obviously very important that they're listening deeply. So oh, that's a, that's a very very interesting. Probably something that I should practice a little bit more is listening better. But um, so 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 another interesting point, you know, leadership in the military, you are you are you know you're assessed on your ability to lead from you know day one in the military right up until you eventually retire or or get out. So uh, so speaking of leadership in the military ranks, obviously it's something that's that's pretty popular. I don't know if that is you know truly um, if that's also representative of a civilian sector organization. Um, so some of our senior executive service folks have don't are not did not necessarily have service in their in their background. So when you bring the military two stars, three stars together, and the SES with with military and civilian sectors, were there any unique challenges that you had to overcome, or any differences, I guess, in how they might have approached uh, different leadership challenges? Yeah, I. I don't know if it's like the approaching the leadership challenges um, differently as it is. Um, usually the SESs are smaller in number, right? So we might have 25 admirals to five SESs. And so the conversation, of course, naturally can lean more towards the naval leadership. But if I just think about our just our most recent class in November, we had a number of SESs that the just in the conversation, just very insightful. And it was great to see the admirals learning from or picking up the conversation from the SES. I think where the difference lies is that because of the military and because leadership and the idea of leadership and command is built into the career, you have more opportunities to um, experience it or have conversations about it, etc. What we know in the just in the civilian service in general, the same uh, 
opportunities for leader development and a, a uh, systematic career path that has those uh, milestones or those points that allow you to develop certain leadership capabilities is not necessarily the same. So if there's any difference, it's, it's primarily based on what their, the way their career systems are signed. And it's interesting because part of our focus this year uh, that was we actually had them looking at the differences in the career systems. And um, there is that delta between very structured career systems and the career system that doesn't necessarily have the same amount of focus on leadership and leader development. And so the feedback that we receive from the SES is they very much appreciate the opportunity, even though there are sometimes, you know, it felt like I'm a fish out of water, very much appreciate the opportunity to engage in the dialogue and vice versa. The number of admirals say it was very good to have a conversation and understand from the SES's perspective um, because of the way the, the, the conversations were structured. Over, I don't know, Liz, if you have any other thoughts on that. Okay, well, thank you. I mean, from Matt, from Matt Santangelo, which is a, he's our regional director uh, for the foundation. Uh, he joined a little bit late, but he says, uh, I, I wonder if there are similar courses for div div division officers and department heads and commanding officers along the way. Also, do they find that aviators struggle with leading large organizations since they were flying in small teams for much of their careers? Just just wondering. So, and I know it might be confusing for some of our audience that, you know, you have the College of Leadership and Ethics that's embedded in the Naval War College, obviously. Um, but right on the Naval Station Newport, you have the Navy Leadership and Ethics Center, where a lot of the junior officers, I guess you might say, junior, even senior officers, if you're going in the command, you're required to go through a course at, at NLAC. Um, but but to, to, to Matt's point a little bit is the I mean, you've got a captive audience with mid-grade and senior level officers, and you have an opportunity to kind of put a foundation in place so that when they become senior leaders, right, you might not have as much work to do that maybe you, maybe you have now. So I, I just want to maybe you can speak to that a little bit, maybe the relationships and the, you know, how do we get after the, the entire force? Yes, yeah, so... Um... A couple of thoughts. Uh, Liz mentioned uh, our our now retired colleague, Captain Retired John Meyer, uh, who we credit with the listen to understand versus listen to refute. Uh, while he was leading us in the College of Leadership and Ethics, we were very much also involved with the Command Leadership School at Newport. In fact, he helped stand it up when it used to be uh, well, now it's the Navy Leadership and Ethics Center when it was the Command Leadership School. And what was great and what continues to be great about that relationship, because we continue to work with the current CEO, is we can leverage what we are learning and help them in developing their uh, curriculum. And so I've been at the War College 10 years and, and um, I have seen the evolution of the Command Leadership School and now the Navy Leadership and Ethics Center, where they are incorporating a number of the, if I, I'll say it this way, learning and growth tools and methods that we're using at the flag level for their division head, department head school and the major command courses. Of course, those courses have a much more um, uh, direct focus on their specific roles and those specific leadership roles, but they do include some elements of the self awareness, for example, or um, other types of engaging tools. Liz, I think you've done some coaching with them as well, so that I'll let you speak to that. And so there are some elements of what we're doing at the flag level that is happening at the uh, division head and department head um, and major command level. And then, of course, at the Naval War College itself. Um, we have now a leadership in the profession of arms course for all of the students and that course course, the curriculum draws very heavily on what we have learned and done and researched over a number of years in the College of Leadership and Ethics and some of the same sort of learning and development principles that uh, 
we utilize for our flag level courses. Anything to add, Liz? Yeah, I would just maybe further illuminate the um, the courses, both at the Naval Leadership and Ethics Center, as well as what Olenda just mentioned, which is leadership in the profession of arms for all of the war college students. Um, those draw on what we would consider the most foundational elements of capacity expanding leader development curriculum. And so those are things that we utilize in the two star course, which we talk a little bit about. Uh, so self awareness, obviously assessment tools, critical thinking, expanding cognitive capacity, uh, which we also refer to as vertical development. Um, ethics and, and conversations around ethics and, and philosophy. So if we take those four or five foundational items, we have a lot of conversations in the College of Leadership and Ethics, um, both internally and with those other stakeholders and schoolhouses around, okay, so what does this look like at each different level? And what's it, I think starting to evolve throughout the Navy is that you will see more and more of this curriculum actually threading throughout an entire career. Um, so that when we do get to the point where we are at the flag officer leader development courses, a lot of this content will have already been covered and will be at a more advanced level and kind of shift that to the right um, to go deeper and more advanced with the conversation around it. Um, already we're starting to advance the, the flag development courses more towards the organizational development components. So how do these leaders set the tone and climate and culture within their organizations to facilitate the kind of people development that we talk about related to self-awareness, cognitive capacity, et cetera. And so that's something that has already started to happen where it is shifting, but over time, as we take more and more of those fundamental elements into the earlier curriculum, what we see, I guess for Olenda and I in particular, is our job just keeps getting harder and harder. So if we're gonna keep practicing what we preach, as we say, is that we have to keep figuring out what does that next level look like? And what is a more advanced conversation around those topics, uh, which is very challenging. And it's something that we think a lot about. Yeah. Yeah. No, terrific responses. Um, thank you for that. And, and obviously great work. I mean, I, as I just think back in my early years of my career, and maybe that's not early either, you could always tell the good commands from the bad command. It was obvious and it was typically based on the leadership that was, you know, in charge at that, at that time. Um, another question from John Sheehan, you have spoken of listening. What about direct and non-direct probing? Yeah, I saw that question in the chat and I think I'm going to give an indirect answer, but, you know, as professors, we have the right to do that. <laughs> um, I think what's important here is that while we do talk about specific skills, like something like active listening or critical thinking, the, the, the learning and development framework that we spoke about is entirely built around this concept of what's called vertical development. And that's the idea of expanding cognitive capacity. So we think about the developmental maturity of our minds, of our cognitive and affective abilities becoming more and more complex over time. And so the idea of talking about things like listening skills or, or probing skills or other kind of conversational skills that, that one might need at a senior level, while that is important, we consider those things, the skills, tools, competencies that kind of fill their leadership cup over the course of 30 years, that they don't necessarily need us to come in and enhance those things. They don't necessarily need us to come in and teach new elements or components of those things. If they need to pursue that education, they of course will. Um, but what we do is acknowledge the fact that they already have those skills, tools, and competencies, but that there's also a lot to it. And in order to apply those things more effectively in, in changing emergent, unprecedented scenarios as things become more complex in their leadership environment, what we offer is a capacity expanding experience so that they can do more with all of those tools and skills and that they have more ability to sort through those things and accurately apply the right thing to the right situation, um, as well as the resilience component of just simply how overwhelming and demanding senior leadership is at that level, especially when you have all of those tools in that leadership toolkit. And so our focus is very much on expanding the capacity for what you do, as opposed to at this point, trying to add any more individual tools or skills or items. Yeah, and I think what I would add to that, Liz, is the way from uh, the uh, educational framework, 
very much into an active learning paradigm. And so, um, in other words, we wouldn't necessarily have a session on active listening. Rather, we would engage in some type of learning intervention that will facilitate the broadening of that capacity. And, um, and so it is a much more behavioral and cognitive approach as opposed to us laying out sort of um, the concepts themselves, because as Liz pointed out, we're operating under the assumption that they already possess some level of these different skills and tool sets, particularly as George said, you know, you've, you've, you've uh, gotten to this point after 30 years of leading and our job is to um, use this developmental and educational approach which is very much centered on active learning and active engagement in order to help them experience what it is to expand that uh, expand those uh, capacities over okay. no thank you so i guess the the one last question i get and i think alinda you you got to it a little bit when you said you know how do we know that we've got it right so so, um, you know, you identify again, I'm looking at my very parochial kind of course structure. You have some terminal objectives, some learning objectives. So what are your measures of effectiveness that you are indeed that 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 you are that you're penetrating these senior leaders that they're taking on board? Obviously, a lot of the work that you're doing and then how do you. How do you change that moving forward to adjust it and, and develop you know, new objectives or new methods? Uh, so it's continuous and I'll certainly let uh, Liz jump in here too. I think first of all is we challenge the paradigm. Um, everything that we've done is actually, as you pointed out, George, we've challenged a number of traditional Navy paradigms and Navy culture. And this idea that everything is measurable or you need some concrete of measures, some concrete point in time measure to determine effectiveness uh, has some limitations. And that just comes from the, the research in uh, the science of teaching and learning and education. We know these things. And so. We um, allow for um, assessment, if you will, in a variety of different and ongoing ways. So certainly throughout the course, as I mentioned, we have the daily feedback, but that feedback, for example, doesn't ask, what did you like? What was the, what, 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 what did you like uh, about the session today? Or what was good or what was bad? But rather, the types of questions align with uh, reflection and getting them to assess their own development. So, if you uh, just think about some of the examples that we gave, those examples were driven by the question itself that required them to reflect upon their own growth as opposed to what they did or didn't like about the course. And we also don't view the course as just a single opportunity for development. So we maintain engagement with these admirals over the course of the year. So each month we send them um, uh, different uh, props. We uh, prompts. We um, uh, tap back into some of the things that were covered during the course or ideas that were raised. Um, and we tend to get feedback from uh, the animal. So, for example, there's one particular exercise without going into the exercise, but it's it's become uh, labeled as the big fish or the fifth fish. And it just has to do with, uh, again, expanding their cognitive capacities. And it's been great to uh, hear from the number of admirals who said, hey, I've been thinking about that big fish and this decision that I have to make, right? And so part of that measurement gets to, uh, are the things that we engage becoming an embedded part of the way in which they're approaching their leadership? And so there are a variety of different ways that um, for us speak to whether or not we are, um, not necessarily getting it all all right, because certainly that's not the case, but certainly making a a difference and having an impact on the way these leaders lead. Liz, other thoughts? 
I would just add in that um, in addition to us asking for that feedback at multiple different points, I'd say the biggest indicator has been when they reach back out to us and ask for more. So when they say that they want ideas around how to bring these concepts into their teams, when they ask us for follow on content or readings or whatever it might be, or when they ask us to come speak or work with them, um, that has probably been the most significant realization that not only do they like these concepts, not only do they think that they're going to be applicable, but that they're actually going back into their work and into their organizations and deliberately finding a way to draw them back in. And so when we hear that, we know we're probably hitting the mark. Thank you very much. I mean, excellent points. Um, I, I, I truly appreciate that. I'm seeing it's seven o'clock, so sensitive to the time. Thank you again, Dr. Johnson and Dr. Cavallaro for this a terrific presentation. It was truly an honor to host both of you tonight and uh, speak about a very interesting topic. It's amazing how complex it's gotten. Uh, and we truly appreciate you taking time out of your busy schedules uh, to spend it with us. Uh, so thank you. Uh, thank you again. Ladies and gentlemen, this concludes tonight's presentation. Thank you again for joining us and please check out our website for a list of presentations uh, beginning in January 2021 and be sure to follow us on Facebook, Instagram, LinkedIn, Twitter and YouTube. And for those of you with any last minute holiday shopping needs, please visit our museum store online via our web page at nwcfoundation.org for, for some, um, some spectacular stocking stuffer ideas. Have a great rest of your evening and thank you again. Thank you, everybody.